Okay, hello everyone. Uh, hello and welcome. I'm Harold Offe. Um, I'm an artist and a reader uh, in fine art here at Leeds Beckett University. And thank you so much for joining us here today uh, for this, uh, our first in a series of four talks planned in collaboration with Leeds Art Gallery and Leeds Beckett University. Um, the talks are all organized to expand and enrich um, the themes and ideas explored in the exhibition, Natural Encounters. Um, it's sadly currently closed due to the current lockdown, but hopefully due to reopen soon uh, when it's safe to do so. And the exhibition will be running till the 20th of February next year. So hopefully you'll get a chance to see um, the show. It's great. Um, I'm thrilled actually more than thrilled, ecstatically like a happy bunny, uh, <laughs> to be joined by three phenomenal artists today. Um, we have Sade Misha, Roseanne Robertson and Victoria Sin. Sade's work, It Takes Time, I love saying that, It Takes Time, um, exploring the intersections between sexuality, gender, identities, mental health, and the natural world is part of the exhibition Natural Encounters um, here at Leeds Art Gallery. And they will be speaking of this work uh, later in their presentation. All three artists' practices could be said to be informed by an inter interdisciplinary set of practices termed queer ecologies, um, which is uh, our title for today's event. Um, these are practices that reimagine nature, biology, and sexuality, as well as evolutionary processes, ecological interactions, and environmental politics, in light of queer theory. This is thinking that disrupts heteronormative notions of nature, standing as a powerful corrective to views that equate natural with straight, while queer is, um, often held in, uh, to be against nature. As Catriona Sanderlands and Bruce Erickson write in their intro to the anthology on queer ecologies, perhaps the, queer, the, perhaps the key question for queer ecologies is, what does it mean that ideas, spaces and practices designated as nature are often so vigorously defended against queers in a society in which that very nature is increasingly degraded and exploited. I'm sure we'll return to this question in the discussion, but perhaps we should also address the term queer, um, which has evolved over time and place from a synonym for odd to a homosexual slur to a reclaimed politically charged adjective, noun and verb. As the queer theorist Sharon Marcus writes, Queer has become a compact alternative to lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, but it also emphasizes affinity over identity. It is often referred to as an umbrella term for all non-heterosexual identities. However, within queer theory, queer is often used as a verb. So queering can become a tool for the social and political subversion of the dominant culture a way of perhaps challenging and deconstructing dominant hierarchies, power structures, binaries, and notions of essentialist identities. Poet and writer Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick, one of the originators of queer theory, for example, says that queer can mean to open mesh, the open mesh of possibilities, gaps, and excesses of meaning when the constituent elements of anyone's gender or anyone's sexuality aren't made or can't be made to signify monolithically. Again, we will, be, we will see how queering as a subversive tool is played out in the practices of the three artists speaking here today. And I'm sure we'll return to this in the discussion afterwards. Um, so just to explain, uh, the format for today's event is as follows. I will introduce the artists and following that, um, they will speak for about 10 to 15 minutes each and also generously share some work with us. Um, after that, we'll take about a five minute comfort break 
um, and then return for 30 minutes or so of discussion for the last part of the session. Um, as you can see, um, we have disabled the Q&A chat function. Um, so this is in order to just create a safe space for our speakers and participants today. But any questions or comments you should have can be sent to a specially created email address, which is queer ecologies talk, one word, uh, at gmail.com. Queer ecologies talk, one word, at gmail.com. I'll, I'll mention this a few times um, throughout uh, the, during the presentations just to give people an opportunity. Um, and we encourage you to kind of send in your questions and comments um, during the presentation section. You don't have to wait until everyone's spoken. Um, and um, we'll, we'll pick out a selection of these to read um, during the, the, the question and answer. Um, since we've had uh, an incredible amount of interest and participation in the events, uh, we won't be able to obviously read out all the questions and comments, so we apologise in advance for that. Um, but do know that your comments and questions are, will be read and are most appreciated. Um, so you may also notice that we have a BSL signer here with us today. Um, this is Natalie. And um, uh, those of you who need BSL interpretation might want to just pin Natalie's video, particularly throughout the, the presentations. And um, lastly, just to let you know, we will be recording and transcribing the video, which will be made available um, after the event. So without much further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Sade Misha. Um, Misha's current practice is rooted in exploring the self, the self in relation to gender and performance. In the artist's words, how the world around me affects my relationship to, to my queerness and the body I inhabit, how movement is policed by environment and us, and how fraught the control over our perception is when thrust outside of solidarity environments. Misha explores how their body is freed and restricted, liberating myself and my limbs in the British countryside, po uh, posturing against vast landscapes foreign to me. Misha also uses textiles, um, often in their practice, to askew the expectation of stealth bestowed upon trans people and our bodies, uh, this is a quote, sorry, and embrace unmasking the performative nature of gender. Um, so uh, yeah, without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Sade. Hello, hello. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks for that wonderful intro. Um, I'm Sade Misha. And I think my presentation will show on screen soon. Let's go the first slide. My body is rarely seen in abyss. Always blue. It's new this, white. Most of the time I'm squashed, faking sinew as a clubber through the gaps. Mm. Grace is considered feminine, so I am not. I hate myself for running, clamouring towards the enemy. I don't want to be on side, that's the point. The trim, the trousers, the lines. Still with a 16 quid sheen on the lips. It's to be all, nothing, something else entirely. Mm. Yeah. That was a clip from a film called Dulux Abyss. Um, this is where my whole kind of project to do with e ecologies and nature and my body started, um, even though that is a film indoors. Um, the project was about looking at how posturing is gendered and how I feel that if my body is postured in a certain way, um, or if I move in a certain way, I feel that certain expectations are put on me, whether masculine, feminine, male or female. And so that project itself was um, me using life drawing poses from the art classes that I'd been to. Um, again, those that are gendered male and those that are gendered female, using them both to um, 
kind of toe the line in between and erase the binaries as a non-binary person kind of looking to exist somewhere in the middle and outside of the binary all at once. Um, and the postures um, have been a massive part of my practice since. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, we'll see an image. So this is, again, like the actual start of the project. Um, I had a brief where I was to make work about something that's completely selfish, that I do that's completely selfish for myself and nobody else. And the only thing I could really think of was traveling and being outside, getting to grips with nature. And so I didn't know how to kind of convey that in an artistic way. Um, again, because it's selfish, it's not something that I do for um, aesthetic reasons. It's just something that I do for pleasure. But I wanted to explore, particularly the British countryside, I'm from Manchester, the North. So um, I wanted to get out and see true nature, so to speak. I was very confined to Manchester and my idea of nature was very limited um, to like Heaton Park, which is a park that we have in Manchester that's not a very, um, it's a public space, it's not very overgrown or anything like that. There's no wildlife or anything. Um, and so I wanted to really get out there and put my body in situations I hadn't been in before, having to go through different terrains and all of that. And the plan was to mostly to document the spaces, not necessarily myself um, or anything that I was doing, but it ended up that the posturing just kind of came to me naturally because I'd worked on that project previously and I was still making work to do with how my body is gendered and how I feel um, kind of confined at times to my, the way I present and how that is um, prescribed different things by different people. Um, and so it just kind of ended up that I would be in these places and would just start moving and capturing that. And at first it was something that I did with people. Um, so this is uh, in Charlie, uh, not, not too far from where I'm from. And I went with my friend, Megan, and again, so it wasn't this solitary experience. Um, there was no kind of solitude, no um, independent <laughs> kind of thinking and pause and, and seeing the space around me. It was interacting with other people. Um, but Megan actually took this picture. And again, I'm in the same pose as in the first film. And um, I just, something about it just really spoke to me. In this picture, I'm actually wearing one of the binders that I make again, another, um, kind of commentary on gender and performance and how clothes can be performance. Um, and yeah, I just liked that it was this, I mean, the whole day was chaotic and we were falling in the mud and my body was being pushed to new heights. And I was there with my top off, topless in a PVC, like see-through binder and our cars going past like over the way. And um, it was, a real kind of test of stamina um, amongst other things and like comfort, how much uh, I feel comfortable engaging with the nature and having my body kind of exposed as well. But the final product I really, really enjoyed and it kind of pushed me to continue getting out into um, different landscapes. Um, and so from there, uh, I have a film, the next film um, is the kind of one of the, the start of the, the series, the actual series of me using these poses in the landscapes. Um, yeah, so we'll go to the next, next slide.
So that film was, um, that's my mum next to me there. The piece is called With My Mum in Malham. Uh, and Malham is a place in Yorkshire that I've returned to many times in this project. Um, I originally found it because I was looking for waterfalls. I uh, started Googling, trying to find a place because I really wanted a waterfall as a backdrop. And then once I got to Malham, I just found so much diversity in the landscape um, and so many beautiful places to film. And uh, as I was saying, like the beginning of the project, I was kind of working with people. Um, so here you can see my mum doing, doing the poses with me. And it kind of, it puts a different spin, I guess, on the, the original intention, which again was to um, have a commentary about gendered performance. Um, and it, and it adds something else, I guess. There are a lot of layers with my mum my in the video. Um, but it's the first kind of taste of this routine, this, um, this actual kind of choreographed performance that I do. And it just became this thing that I, I felt compelled to do every new place that I went, whether it was indoors or outdoors or um, in the north of England or Barcelona when I went on holiday, I just felt compelled to archive these landscapes and archive myself in them and again explore these different terrains and see how my body would react um, and also people around me as well at times they can be um, it can just be me around nobody else is there nobody else can see me filming but in this instance um, many people that we had to film a few times and the the making of it is just as important as the final piece the experience of me leading my mum, teaching her the poses, the people seeing us. Um, there were like many people around going on walks and hikes and at a cafe across the road and they watch us and they are confused obviously because we're doing something strange um, in the water. It's not just in the, the grass, um, but the tripod set up. And yeah, that's, that's a big part of it for me as well. Um, I have of course it's a commentary on you know queerness and gender but it's also for me when I'm out making these films and exploring these landscapes it's definitely um my race and my weight are very much on my mind so I would say my weight in terms of how I can actually tackle the landscape so in some of the when I went to um, Amalam and actually found the, the waterfall, having to push my body um, to be able to head up and down like rocks and into the water and just down like dangerous kind of uh, landscapes that I'm not used to. Um, being very aware of that and also being very aware of me being a black person in these rural places and having people, that in general, but having people watch and see me doing these strange things, I know that it's um, very out of place and it's compounded by my being black um, and probably queer too as well. Um, so it's all just kind of been a, a big learning experience for me and been something that has garnered strange interactions <laughs> and um, commentary, but, um, yeah, it's been very freeing um, and not everything is planned. So if we go to the next film, we'll see. Um, this was in, I'd gone to Southport for the day. Um, it was a bit of a trying day. I tried to find, again, just beautiful landscapes uninterrupted without people um, kind of having to stand and watch <laughs> as sometimes can happen. And I just had like a terrible time. So I was heading home and I just drove past this massive plane. I think it's a kind of like a wildlife reserve where you can you can head on there, you can walk on there. And um, yeah, it was just nice to have this spontaneous moment finishing. Um, like I say, the, the whole project, the whole uh, process is so important to me as well. So having this kind of failure of a day and then finding this space where I could just collect myself and have this like perfect half and half screen of the sky and the land was really great.
head to the next slide. Um, again, back in Malum. Um, so again, we can hit, see uh, the, the difference in the landscapes, having to kind of trawl through these um, rocks. And here is, this was just in motion, um, trying to take not necessarily choreographed images. I'm trying to err more on the side of um, like natural movement. Obviously in those films, you can see it's a recurring theme of me bending and doing the kind of life drawing slash yoga poses. But I really want to uh, document how my body naturally moves and how I naturally, again, posture myself and how I, my stance um, typically is because I think there's more more in that and there's more kind of um, authenticity in that. I've tried to just record myself walking um, to see my gait and see how I hold myself um, and I think since I started the project my feelings have changed in terms of why I do this and why, why I'm documenting myself so much. At first it was because I felt frustrated with the way that um, I would be gendered by certain people or the, the binaries that I was like held against. Um, I was frustrated with my body for being curvy and having um, breasts and being considered feminine and no matter how I dressed and how I uh, positioned myself. I would be considered that way when I didn't necessarily feel comfortable with that. Um, and then it kind of, seeing myself so much, seeing, documenting myself so much and um, kind of seeing how far my body could go, being proud of how much I could kind of push my body and um, be at one, so to speak, with these landscapes and just do things that I didn't expect. Um, it's made me kind of readjust. I don't feel that that stress anymore. And, and showing my body so much to people within these works, having them see like every fat roll, every um, bit of my chest, um, having them see everything, it's very, very freeing. Um, and also being in those landscapes where everything is just huge and you realize how small you are in the, the grand scheme of things it can be it can be isolating but it can be freeing too um I just feel a lot less constricted by my body in terms of um perception and a lot more free in terms of like my abilities which is really great um if we go to the next slide um so this was the last place I visited before the first lockdown so I'd been making the work since like July last year, and this was in February of this year. And again, it kind of goes to, it speaks to, um, I'd planned to head to Windermere, but um, found this on the way, didn't know, didn't know where it was, didn't know where I was. I lost my phone reception, so a um, bit dangerous. Um, but this was a place called Ulfa. And yeah, I don't know, I, it was a really, really beautiful place and I took some really strong images there and it was kind of um, kind of nice farewell <laughs> to the traveling for a while prior to the lockdown um, but this uh, head into this space there was nobody there um, completely on my own cars drove past but just being um, in a space so kind of foreign to me I've never seen anything like this where I'm from we don't have um, landscapes like this so a real treat um, and just being able to really set myself free and do these things that might seem strange when people are watching and interacting with, with the nature in a way that isn't normal um, so to speak it isn't the norm it isn't typical um, posturing myself on rocks trying to get to the highest rock and do a strange life drawing pose is not the norm but it just makes for a really a really fun experience and really great art as well sometimes. Um, but yeah, like it, it, especially because we've been locked down, the one thing that has kind of gotten me through is reminiscing on these times and these, these spaces and knowing that I can kind of eventually, hopefully get back out there. Um, if we head to the next slide, we'll see. Um, so this was at, 
probably a few weeks, maybe a month or two into the pandemic, um, having to adapt as well. So of course I can't always travel um, beyond my hometown <laughs> by law because of the pandemic, but also because, you know, sometimes um, my body might not permit it. Um, my mental space might not permit it. And so here was me trying to make the, the best of that. Um, this is my dad's back garden. I, I've moved since then, but I, yeah, I was trying to indulge my, my need to be in nature with like what I had. Um, and right, right before the pandemic, I planned to do a project on exploring uh, where I'm from, Moston, New Moston in Manchester, and trying to find these beautiful, so to speak, landscapes there and see if I could make some beautiful out there. And the pandemic really forced me to do that. Um, so these were just a few few shots, like some of the more scenic views from, from my back garden. Um, but it's been really nice as well. It's made me appreciate Again, not to sound like too cliche, but it's made me appreciate the the beauty around me. And um, in terms of like coming, coming from this as an artist, appreciate the kind of backdrops and the scenery and the um, outdoor studio, so to speak, everywhere around me. It doesn't always have to be me traveling through Yorkshire or um, through <laughs> Norwich even. Um, sometimes I can, um, find that base elsewhere. Um, yeah, and so if we go to the next slide, um, I guess this has been the kind of peak of my work in the outdoors. Um, I wanted to make a film of my counselling experience. I wanted to make something tangible um, to kind of memorialise my experience with counselling last year. And I was immediately drawn to being outdoors. I, I knew that it had to be um, in an outdoor setting. And I just had the idea to take two chairs, set them up in somewhere beautiful <laughs> and um, just record myself speaking. I'd had a really trying time with my mental health. Um, and I had a really amazing experience with counselling. And the two things that made me feel centered and kind of sane were being outdoors um, and being in those sessions. So I figured like, why not combine the two? Um, so this image is from my, um, well, the film is actually showing in Leeds now with Natural Encounters, but it was made for my, a solo show in Norwich um, called It Takes Time, like the film. And, yeah, I got these chairs at work actually. <laughs> I'd really wanted some like old style mid-century chairs and I turned a corridor at work, found them and pretty much claimed them straight away. And so I trolled, this was in um, Monsell in Manchester. I trolled through, again, it's kind of a, it's not, it's not like a rural landscape at all. You can see in the background, there's a, a big block of flats, but around there, there's like a school, there's lots of houses and stuff. So it's very urban. Um, but I was able to kind of catfish, so to speak, and make it seem like a beautiful, um, mossy kind of landscape. And I just set my chairs up, took the picture. And then um, if we go to the next slide. Um, so with the original exhibition, the, the chairs accompany it on a patch of land. And I really just wanted to bring that kind of feel, feeling that I got being outside into the gallery and have people be able to experience that. Um, I just wanted it to feel immersive um, and I want to do more kind of installation stuff. Um, and yeah, so the next, the film that you'll see in a minute is called It Takes Time and it's me talking and kind of, I wouldn't even say imitating a counseling session. It was me actually having a counseling session with myself. And the original idea was to ask my actual counsellor to be there, but I thought I might step, be stepping the line, so I didn't ever ask. Um, but I went to Malham, trolled through the river that you saw me in before, brought the chairs over and um, just sat and talked. And it was really, again, really free and it wasn't weird at all. Um, people were walking past, but it was fine. Um, and people asked questions. 
but it just feels like something that I'll definitely return to. I, I did make another one in my back garden. It wasn't as beautiful, but um, it, it just feels like a staple now, definitely something that will continue within my practice. Um, and I'll continue to grow and, again, have a different relationship with my body in the outdoors, with my thoughts in the outdoors. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, glad I, I'm glad I did it. Um, I guess that's me done now. But uh, if we go to the next slide, you'll see a little clip of it next time. I feel good this week. Um, I feel like optimistic. I feel ready to, I don't know, ready to continue on the stuff that I left over from last year. It is a bit of pressure when you go into a new year and it's like you're supposed to make all of these changes and you're supposed to make the most of your time and you're supposed to, I don't know, have this like blank slate and start fresh and it can be a bit much <laughs> this expectation that you're really gonna like go for your goals and I don't know just feel like brand new and that you've got to make something of yourself and it, I don't know it's like you spend all of the December really gathering things up and rounding things off and building up to this like peak and this like I don't know apex and then it January it's just like Brilliant. Thank you so much, Sade. That was fantastic. Um, so just a reminder, you can send uh, any questions or comments to the queer ecologies talk at gmail.com. Um, our next uh, artist is Roseanne Robertson. Um, Roseanne Robertson is a contemporary artist currently based in West Cornwall. Um, having recently relocated from West Yorkshire. Their practice spans across sculpture, photography, drawing and performance to explore the boundaries of the human body and its environment. In the artist's words, my non-binary relationship with gender and my experience of gender non-conformity is, is part of my experience and my experience is not separated from my work. During 2020, Robertson has uh, been a selected studio holder at Portsmouth Studios in St. Ives, continuing sculptural works that explore the terrain of the queer body in the seascape, its caves, openings, and overspills. Bodies of work in equal parts, sculpture, drawing, and video capture, moments of schisms and shifts, often exploring negative space, expanded representations of the figure and automatism. Robertson's body of work is titled Stone Butch, uh, was exhibited as a, a contemporary intervention within the display of work by Barbara Hepworth at the Hepworth Wakefield and in a group exhibition associated matter at Yorkshire Sculpture Park uh, as part of the Yorkshire Sculpture International in 2019. So um, I'm going to hand over to Roseanne. Thank you. Thanks, Harold. Thank you for the introduction and hello, everybody. I'm really pleased to be here uh, talking to you today. So if we could start my presentation, please. Um, I want to start my talk with some of the terms that we're using. So when we talk about queerness, I want to talk about that as an identity and how I identify, how I ad identify and also um, queer ecology and how my work connects to the subjects within it. Um, I find it a really expansive collection of subjects and experiences. Um, and there's so many ways I think that we can connect with it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take us through a couple of important aspects of my own queerness, and then through a selection of works that are to do with the connection between my body and the environment. Um, like Sade's, mine is a bit of a geographic timeline. So taking you through some different places which include Manchester, Sunderland, uh, West Yorkshire, and West Cornwall. So if I could have the next slide, please. So, so queerness to me, um, it's an active statement. Um, there's a statement that I first came across when I graduated in Manchester by a queer art collective, Homo Cult, which says to query everything. 
Um, for me, this really resonates. And I think when I understood that the structures around me were false and didn't speak to me and didn't serve me and who I was and my gender and sexuality, I questioned everything else. You know, you see, it's intersectional for me and it's just really involves questioning the systems around us um, and the ways that we're expected to be based on certain sort of constructs and norms. Um, the work of homo cult and other queer artists that I met in Manchester's queer DIY art and music scene taught me everything that the commercial gay scene couldn't. And I made a space within that scene to experiment with sound, music, performance, activism by being part of artist led um, projects and starting bands and queer collectives. Um, so the image that you can see here on the left is me um, in a band called Ill. The image in the middle is from a homo cult and on the right I'm with my partner Sharp, a queer art space um, that we started called the Penthouse in Manchester. Um, so for me, around this time, we was, it still felt like we were freshly rec reclaiming the word queer from its abusive past. And for me, I've been called queer since growing up as a young girl in the sense that the old ladies down the shops used to say that she's a queer lass, um, mean and strange or unusual in the, in the respect that I didn't look often how they thought a little girl should look. Um, so obviously the term has been used to, to mean odd or unusual, but it was adopted as a homophobic slur, particularly used against gay men. The term dyke has a similar history and it's been reclaimed also in a similar way. So we've removed the hate and the fear from these words and made a positive space to question and understand ourselves in our own terms. Protests and activism. So if we could have the next slide, please. Um, yeah, protest and activism is a big part of who I am. Um, as soon as I could, I marched and found my community. This is on Manchester Pride. Um, the image on the left is with me and my partner Sharp taking a queer art show onto Manchester Pride. And queerness doesn't stop for me at certain gay people and lesbians getting equality and then having a nice big party. Um, it asks us to continue fighting for those who are oppressed. Uh, trans people have experienced transphobia within the LGBTQI plus community. And that's something that we're living through today. Trans and non-binary people are fighting for their rights and for their lives today. We take whatever privilege we've gained and we use it to fight for others. So I've identified as lesbian, gay woman, butch, mask, and lesbian culture has worked for me because it involves a gender spectrum of butch and femme and everything in between. So I choose queer because for me, it's a place of solidarity. Anyone across the LGBTQIA plus spectrum can be queer. Uh, the image on the right here is a solidarity march. This is a counter protest to transphobic interjections by a small group of people um, at London Pride in 2018. This is our response on Manchester Pride. So I'm queer and non-binary and I'm a trans ally and activist. Uh, if we could have the next slide. And I'd just like to move on from sort of how I identify in terms of queerness with how it connects with queer ecologies. What I've tried to show with the origins of my queerness is that this isn't a theory for me. So I didn't learn about queer ecologies and then start and met, started making some work. It's, it's really based on my life and experience. Um, in the History of Sexuality by Michel Foucault, it lays a groundwork of an understanding of queerness as being against nature. This lies at the heart of queer ecologies. It's natural versus unnatural, and that's at the crux of, the, of gender and sexuality-based oppression. So it's a Western construction that's been used to oppress both ourselves and others. The biological definition of binary sex and the heterosexist norms that have been built around gender are policed in order to keep them in place. And those who are seen to deviate are criminalized and diagnosed as mentally unwell. So for me, it's the shift from the norm, the seeping through the boundaries or the many ways that we transcend this that opens up many of the subjects within queer ecologies, including the barriers and boundaries of the body and the ways that we engage with our environment in a fluid way. And for me, I describe it as exploring the, queer, the terrain of the queer body. I also play with or show up some of the violences of the constructs that have existed within. Um, so non-binary or transgender, non-conforming people, there's, a, there's often um, a narrative of hate, of hating themselves. And for me, 
Um, one of my favourite novels that sort of speaks of this experience and speaks of my own um, experience of gender is Storm Butch Blues by Les Feinberg. I'm just going to read something from the first chapter, which sets the scene of a butch woman or a masked person um, on a date that's been set up by a friend. And it reads, I was looking at her while she was walking, thinking to myself, I'm a stranger in this woman's eyes. She's looking at me, but she doesn't see me. Then she finally said how she hates this society for what it's done to women like me, who hate themselves so much they have to look and act like men. I felt myself getting flushed. My face twitched a little and I started telling her, all cool and calm, about how women like me existed since the dawn of time, before there was oppression, and how those societies respected them. And she got very interested. She got her very interested expression on, and besides, it was time to leave. So non-binary or trans or gender non-conform people do not hate themselves and they do not choose one gender because they hate another. And the works I want to discuss start with this piece uh, titled To the Ground. So this situates a white vest as a base layer within the work. This is an assembled sculpture using a white vest and red sandstone from a, a performance for camera carried out below a red sandstone cliff in a on a beach in Portugal. Uh, during the performance, I cut out the shape of my body in the sand and the white vest became a canvas or like a thin layer um, or a barrier between the body and exter external forces. So I repeatedly use um, items such as white vest, white sports socks and white shorts. Um, and in doing so, for me, I'm, I'm considering the masquerade or the three article rule, which has been imposed on LGBTQI plus communities and the ongoing violence towards gender fluidity. So another work I want to show you, if you could put the next slide on, please, is a piece called Interior. Um, this is a large scale sculpture and it's assembled by building a ceiling of 400 individual red bricks hung by nylon cords. Um, so it's a big scaffold, stru scaffold structure. It's, uh, it's amplified um, using contact mics and then I play the work in a live performance. Um, for me, the process and the labour intensive nature of the work connects with my work and class upbringing, and my relationship with growing up in post-industrial environment in a tiny red brick miners cottage in Sunderland. My relationship with gender involves the heritage of upholding industry with heavily gendered roles. I was very aware as a young girl of what I was expected to do. And from a young age, I had identified strong, strongly with masculinity, but my relationship with, its, with masculinity is kind of wonky and precarious. It's both comforting and oppressive. Um, yeah, if we could have the next slide, please. I'm gonna take us quickly through the country now to West Yorkshire. Um, this is it's a place where I was working called the Bridestone Moor. It's above Tomerden and Calderdale, where I lived at the time. So like I say, we've made a big leap from living in an urban environment where I moved to originally for the safety of the LGBTQIA plus scene, then to Hebden Bridge and Tomerden, um, which is a place in a way that gave me access to open countryside and the natural landscape. My relationship with the natural began to deepen as I went from thinking of very interior spaces to more wide open space and to working in public and outside for the first time. Um, for me, this brings up another subject within queer ecologies, which is about access to the natural landscape and what problems and free freedoms are actually inherent within the natural landscape itself. So the natural landscape is tied closely with and is part of our heterosexist systems related to land ownership, our control over the natural landscape, and dominance over wildlife. It's also not known for its diversity in general. Um, so small towns, rural places, remote um, communities are not known for being safe places for queer people who are often more pushed into cities. It's difficult to explain um, how it feels to be marginalized from a space that should be freely accessed and should be for everyone to enjoy. And I also think it's only been a certain demographic who've been championed to work outside or in the public realm and to take up space in this way. So this um, place that I was working with, um, I was working with the rock formations of the bride stones. And for me, I saw them as queer bodies of stone. Um, for me, when you look at these formations and you add a long period of, of time, 
these um, formations are changing through the process of erosion and compression and they're fluid and plural, plural and, and free form and kind of it goes against what we think about stones being you know set in stone something that's solid that's unchanging um, so what you can see here is me making a sculpture by, um, by plaster casting within the cracks and the crevices of the stones and I was there over a period of time leading up to Yorkshire Sculpture International for which I was an associate artist so these sculptures are called chasm schism and they look at negative space um, and a fracture of both phys physical and inner landscape. Can I have the next slide, please? So yeah, so this is a video of me carrying one of the sculptures back across the mirrors, if you could play the video. It's not a very glamorous video. It's literally at the end of a um, really challenging time making the work, but I, it was a it was a really I enjoyed that moment of basically lifting this plastic cast out of the, the shape of, in the in the rocks and then carrying it back to the studio across the moors. Um, so if we look at the next slide, it just shows that work installed at the Hepworth Wakefield. It was installed as a body of works called Stone Butch, as Harold mentioned before. So it's drawing the Chasm Schism sculptures and there was a video titled Pissing. Um, so now as a pair of sculptures, I was, I was considering the idea of duality of masculinity and femininity. And this was further explored with the position of, positioning of the works within the permanent display of Barbara Hepworth's work in Gallery 3 at the Hepworth and Wakefield. So Stone Butch was positioned in proximity to two forms by Barbara Hepworth in marble made in 1937. So moving on to um, some other works that are made during the same time, if we could have the next slide. So this period of making work also resulted in performance for camera works and this one's titled Stone Body Water. It connects stone, the body and water as material in a really direct way, binding the watery and stony body as one. The white clothing became a canvas for the red-brown slippery layers of mulch and residue that lined the smooth stone waterway. So these waterways were situated in the side of the valley and they would have been the waterways that supplied the textiles mills that were built into the side, the steep side of the valley in Hebden Bridge. Um, my body was extended by white sport socks, appendages filled with mulch, um, which it felt like they were trying to form with the shape um, of this bed of stone and sort of attempt and this was quite a heavy flow of water behind me here and it felt like it was trying to take my body down um so this one is a photographic image and the next slide is a video still the video was exhibited at yorkshire sculpture park as part of ysi and um, for me within queer ecologies is an exploration of the human and the non-human equalizing the human and its environment and understanding the human as animal or as one animal among many. And I think this can be seen in works that merge the body and the land. There's many artists who are land artists, but I'm interested in the queer and feminist artists who explore their own bodies in relationship to the land, rather than artists who sort of like manipulate the landscape. Um, artist Anna Mendieta is my key inspiration in this respect. Um, Anna Mendieta was a Cuban American performance artist and sculptor who made earth body works. I'm just gonna read something that Anna Mendieta said. My art is grounded in the belief of one universal energy, which runs through everything, from insect to man, from man to spectre, from spectre to plant, from plant to galaxy. My works are irrigation veins of this universal fluid. Through them ascend the ancestral sap, the original beliefs, the primordial accumulations, the unconscious thoughts that animate the world. So if we could have the next slide. Um, now we're leaping all the way down to West Cornwall. Um, this image shows a making of a more recent work made this year whilst based at Porth Mere Studios in St Ives between January and July this year. Um, so I moved down to Cornwall due to the inspiration of the landscape um, to live on the coast again and to get some light after living in the bottom of a valley for a few years. Um, Working in this environment, I feel more connected to the landscape in the way that there's miles and miles of coastal landscape to explore. And I'm continuously inspired by the coastal erosion and the shaping of rocks by the force of water. The next image, 
I think we've got the next slide, um, shows a, a more closer up image of me casting in it in the same way as I did with at the bride stones, but it's really in, in the middle of this really large crack that's been formed by the sea. And as you can see, I feel really more en engulfed by the landscape. So the force of the sea, hydraulic action and pressure that causes cracks and crevices to deepen is the material in which I was making this new body of work. So the next slide, sorry to go through these a little bit quickly, is Porthmere Studios. So I was in Studio 9 at Porthmere and it faces the Celtic Sea. And I really began to consider the relentless energy of the sea in a new light. So here you can see the chasm schism sculptures installed in the window. Um, it was a really special and unique experience to work in this space because working outside has been mentioned, it can be really challenging. It's really rewarding as well, but to be able to work within the studio with the energy of the sea in the background whilst I was drawing and making work um, was a really unique experience. The next slide shows um, a couple of drawings that I was making at the same time. Um, these drawings are made from experience and memory of when I was making the sculptures and the performance using this sort of crevice. I was also swimming around the tidal pools around that same area, um, swimming around natural tidal pools, stacks of rocks and columns. It was quite an intensive period of like making and it was just after lockdown lifted. Um, so my performance and my drawing involves my relationship with automatism, which I consider to be a relationship of trust. I trust what will come out of my deeper psyche more than what I, more than what is on the surface. For me, it's less tainted by the hostile structures that I bent myself around. So the next slide is the last work that I want to show you made during this time. Um, it's a performance for camera, video work. So I'm interested in with, with this work in the phantom spaces of the body and how they can connect as it in a landscape with the hidden spaces of the coastal landscape. So for me, gender fluidity is spiritual and plentiful and diverse and expanding with eternal potential. There are parts of our bodies and genders that aren't visible as if they are underwater. There are spaces that can't be easily defined that are forever shifting. Um, you can see this work um, hopefully when it's safe to do so at the Hepworth, it's going to be on display until next spring. Um, following this clip that I'm going to play you, I'm going to read you something that I wrote whilst making this work, and that's going to bring me to the end of my presentation. So if you could play the next slide, please. I am between two rocks, between many bodies, genders, with seaweed and white sport sock appendages, penetrating and protruding from my man's door blue shiny shorts is a length of seaweed, which sways with the swelling waters. I part my hair with the sea. There is a rock wedged in the crevice of the rock and I occupy the space below it. Stop resisting, start floating underground with the light of deer head between Eiffel Colcoon's legs in the bath. Double image, duality becomes plural plurality as masculinity and femininity dissolve into the salt water and I am impregnated, birthed, moved, resisting, pushing, floating, ejaculating and swelling with the water. That's the end of my presentation, thank you. Again, really, really fantastic. Thank you so much, Roseanne. Um, and yeah, so generous as well with your references and insights. Okay, um, our next artist is Victoria Sin. Uh, Victoria Sin is an artist using speculative fiction and within performance, moving image, writing and print to interrupt normative processes of desire, identification, and objectification. 
drawing from close personal encounters of looking and wanting, their work presents heavily constructed fantasy narratives on the often unsettling experience of the physical within the social body. Sin has worked with the Queer Ecologies Collective and interdisciplinary intervention into how we live, grow, love, make kin, and stand in allyship with the alter human. Queer ecologies tell new stories about nature and our connection to it, empowering interspe interspecies collaborations and honoring the inherently queer patterns and relations found throughout nature. Um, it's my pleasure to hand over to Victoria. Great, thank you. Just check that you can hear me. Yeah, okay, great, thanks. So for my presentation, I'm going to read a short story that I wrote last year that was published in Mall Journal's Plant Sex Issue on botany and eroticism in 12 essays, short stories, and poems. Uh, it was co-edited in collaboration with the Serpentine Galleries on the occasion of plant sex, part of the General Ecology Project. The Strangler. And so I was devoured in order to be born again. I couldn't be sure if it was a bat or a pigeon, a baboon or a chimpanzee. Really, I imagine it was a toucan or a macaw, soaring through the air up and up as I passed through a mouth a throat, a stomach, bowels, in a glorious fanfare of tropical color before ending up excreted into a crevice of your arboreal arms, my flesh given back to me as the warmth from which I will grow. Part 1. Commensalism. One organism benefits while the other is unaffected. An epiphyte, a noun in botany, a plant that grows on another plant, especially one that is not parasitic, such as the numerous ferns, bromeliads, air plants, and orchids growing on tree trunks in tropical rainforests. I'll grow in the bark of your arms, in your arms, a place to grow among epiphytes that call you home, that adorn you with fans of leaves and great manes of Spanish moss, with scepters of bromeliads and the architectural elegance of the orchids which jewel your crown, you queen. To them you are home, to me you'll be so much more. To you, I will be something you could have never imagined when I arrived in your arms, just a seed of who I will become, a seed on your arm encased in excrement, a seed of change. A seedling growing slowly at first, letting down aerial roots which grow and grow down and down year after year, as if searching for something, aren't we all searching for something? I'm sending them down like Rapunzel's hair swaying in the wind and tangling together and even tangling around you. As if caught in the rain, your hair sticking to your skin, never drying, soft tendrils of hair caressing your bark. While caressing your rough skin, I meet one like myself. Were we born of the same stomach? Wrapped around the same thick trunk, and it hardly matters if I am one or two or even ten. We are the same, whether we are one caressing you or ten. Would you rather we were ten? 
Me and my other, me and myself, we fuse when we touch so that slowly, very slowly, I've become an intricate lacework that adorns you, surrounds you, waits for something. And you hardly even notice when the tips of my lattice of tendrils that encircle and surround you broach the top layers of your rich soil. Part 2. Hemi-Epiphyte Hemiparasite. When the roots reach the soil and begin taking in nutrients from it, the plant becomes known as a hemiepiphyte. When two root tendrils from a strangler fig touch, they fuse together. Because the roots wrap around the trunk of the host tree, they overlap a lot and eventually form a mesh that completely encircles the host. Sometimes, multiple fig plants will grow on the same host tree and will fuse with each other in a process called allofusion. This creates a compound organism that is structurally one plant, but which has genetically different branches. My dense and complex network of roots is tightening, uncomfortable on you now, like a too tight garment in a hot room. I am tightening like a corset around you, choking you and taking your energy, and baby, when my roots hit the ground, it's game over, because that dense and complex network of roots will intertwine with yours, as your nutrients feed me allowing my roots to grow fat and strong. Part 3. Parasitism As the strangler fig grows big enough to be a tree in its own right, it begins to harm its host. The roots thicken and tighten enough to prevent the host tree from growing wider, literally strangling it. Worse, the strangler competes with the host for water, nutrients, and sunlight. Typically, the host tree dies and eventually decomposes, leaving the fig tree standing independently on its own, now strong and woody, but hollow root mesh. Now is my time, and my love, what is yours is mine. And didn't they tell you I am not the kind of parasite that needs to feed off of their host to survive? No, darling. Once my lattice of roots penetrates your soil, the nutrients you depended on will allow my delicate tangled lace to thicken into twigs and then into branches, tightening into an interwoven cage. I will spread like slow liquid, encasing your whole body and swallowing your trunk completely. In our inaugural moment, I send up branches which reach up and up past your crown, that glorious crown jeweled with orchids and bromelaceous scepters. In time, I will have my own. I reach up and up, and fan out my leaves, taking your sunlight, blinding you. Now I am starving you, strangling you, smothering you, suffocating you slowly in my many legs intertwined as they fuse and thicken all over you. And baby, well then you're going to die. Through the whispers and the breeze and the scuttering of insects through the few branches you have left, I feel you are expressing your tiredness, resignation, your readiness to return to the earth. I'm sorry. I never meant to hurt you. I hope you know it's not personal. It's just the way that I am. 
and you are not really gone. You exist in the small animals and tiny beings which live in the hollow where your decaying corpse sits. They live off of your fertile mulch and they are protected in the very negative space where you lived in the soil which is enriched by your decay. Now where you have died, others live, and I'm sure in their own ways they are thankful. They visit you every day, your grave, your memorial sculpted from a tiny seed of change. And living on in the spaces and protections of the fruit which I generously bear, and which will be eaten, and eaten, and eaten, and eaten, and eaten and eaten all year round thanks to my mutualistic insect mate and her daughters, 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 daughter. And let me tell you her dying story at the end of your dying story. Let me tell you a tale of mutualism and of sacrifice that every mother would like to say she would make, but that every single fig wasp makes for her children every few months so that this cycle of sacrifice, death, and rebirth can continue. Part 4. Obligate Mutualism A story older than any amount of time fathomable by any human being. My relationship with the fig wasp begins 65 million years ago, during the time of the dinosaurs, and has evolved into a 750 species epic of fig trees, each with our own species of pollinating wasp. Let me start by saying that my unripe fig is essentially an inside-out, flower-bearing womb called Siconium, containing, depending on the species, hundreds or thousands of flowers maturing at different rates and necessitating the incredibly elaborate help of a wasp for my flowers to pollinate and fruit. Inside these little microcosms, once the seed-carrying flowers have matured, The Siconia release a scent which calls a pregnant wasp through a tiny opening in the center. The opening is small even for her, and the pregnant fig wasp will claw her way in, ripping away her wings and antenna, and bursting her abdomen in the process. At this point, she barely has her body, falling away bit by bit, but she holds fast to the things which will guarantee her success. Her eggs and the pollen from the fig in which she was born. Broken and literally torn apart, she must pollinate the flowers in the fig before laying her eggs. Otherwise, I'd abort the entire fig, of course. After she deposits the pollen, she lays her eggs in the seed-carrying flowers using her ovipositor, a long appendage which helps her impregnate her eggs deep into my flowers. She now has 24 hours to live and somehow manages to inject the flowers with a chemical that transforms them into rounded structures of fat called galls. When the eggs hatch, These will act as nurseries, and with her final task complete, she dies in a bed of flowers, knowing she has done enough to perpetuate the cycle. Just like my seed-carrying and pollen-bearing flowers, her eggs mature at different rates. The first group who emerge from their galls are wingless and almost blind though they do have strong little mandibles which will come in handy on two occasions over their short life. The first, after they hatch, is to bite fertilization holes into the ovary walls of the second group, still immature and enclosed in their galls. They'll then insert their long, thin rear ends into the galls in order to inseminate the wasps inside before they are even hatched. They do this with as many immature wasps as they can, 
moving slowly and awkwardly through my tiny forest of flowers. The second group of fig wasps looks very different. They have wings and antenna and long ovipositors and are born pregnant. This group hatch out of the hole in my gall wall made by the inseminating wasps and, at this exact moment, my pollen-carrying flowers reach maturity and begin to shed, allowing the pregnant and newly hatched wasps to collect my pollen passively in the folds and crevices of their exoskeletons as they move through my dense, pollen-laden flowers. The second time, those powerful mandibles of the first group come in handy as long as there is no competition during the inseminating orgy, is when they are used to bite through my siconium walls to freedom, allowing the pregnant wasps, capable of flight, to fly out in search of another scented fig. While the wingless and blind die on the surface of my now ripening fruit, My seeds, embedded in my sweet meat, now wait for a bat or a pigeon, a baboon or a chimpanzee, or, if I'm lucky, maybe a toucan or a macaw to come along hungry for a taste of my ripe and fatty flesh. And what if it was all the same thing? What if you eat the thing, to fuck the thing, to become the thing, in order to know the thing, that you came from and will go back to the thing? And so I was devoured in order to be born again. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Victoria. Um, that's amazing. Um, we're gonna we're gonna take a break now, and um, for five minutes, and then we'll return to questions. We've got some um, really interesting questions coming through. Um, just to remind people. Um, you can email questions to queer ecology talk at gmail.com. Queer ecology talk at gmail.com. So we'll take a five minute break now and we'll return at uh, 20 past. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, Wow, I mean, uh, you know, it's an ex extraordinary um, group of presentations, um, really insightful, generous, um, that really spoke, I think, to um, three really fantastic practices. Um, we don't have a lot of time. <laughs> There's never enough time. Um, but I'm really glad that we we got the sort of um, the fullness of those fantastic presentations. I really have to thank the artists for the amount of time, care and labor and research. Um, we must never under, uh, underestimate these 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 labors that kind of go into go into the production of, of those sorts of things, those those presentations. Um, I'm going to askew my questions because we have got some really interesting questions um so i'm gonna sort of launch into those um i'll start with a question there are a few questions that are directed to individual artists um so if i start with this one which is from um lucy mcgregor and is directed towards Sade. um uh, Lucy says, hello. Um, I thought the video of Sade backbending just below the horizon line was a beautiful and sensitive visual. 
does this line or horizon have significance to the artist in relation to their body being placed in foreign, in quotation marks, landscapes? How do you choose between a work being documented as a still image or a video? And they say, thanks for the great talk. Thank you. Um, the line didn't ha have any um, significance until after I filmed and I saw it and I was like, oh, that's really, really nice. Um, probably only like two or three <clears throat> times I've had a landscape where it is so flat um, and that kind of uh, imagery has happened. So yeah, it, it was really nice after I saw it and after I saw like the bend and I, I'm like directly under the um, the skyline, which is nice. So that was just coincidence. Um, <clears throat> sorry, what was the second? Yeah, it was how do you choose between the work being documented as a still image or as a video? Um, most of the time I, I do the videos, um, that, that pretty much everywhere I go, I, I do the videos. I've only done images a few times just because it's harder because I go out on my own. And um, if, I, if I put the camera on and like start recording, it's fine. But um, I, I got like this Bluetooth like um, clicker to take video uh, photos so I've only got a few of them because I forget to bring them with me each time so it's not again it's not a conscious uh, decision sorry to <laughs> sorry to not sound so um arty about it but um sometimes I think the photos like the one the first one alone in Charlie that um yeah that 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 place it didn't really need a video the kind of aura was captured in the, the photo I think it's more so um, again, it's just about coincidence, really. I do want to do more pictures, though, because I think they capture something different than the, the repetitive movement. So hopefully I will be a bit more considered about that in the future. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, there, our next question is from Andrew Cummings. Um, again, with many thanks. And... Um, their question is inspired by um, something Roseanne mentioned. Um, uh, and it could be, yeah, so, um, so they say, I think that queerness is by definition anti-normativity and anti-mainstream, but nowadays it also feels like queer or queerness um, have a greater currency and value in the art world and elsewhere and queer risks being neutralized. I'm interested to know what you think about this, whether this feels true to you as well, and whether it is a concern and what queer artists can do to retain the criticality of queer, or is it also the job of curators, gallery professionals and academics? Um, can, maybe Roseanne, would you mind responding to that? Yeah, sure. For me, the sort of expansion of the term and, and it being used more, especially in the, in the art world, it doesn't neutralise it. For me, I'm, I'm someone who wants it to be more of a conversation with as many people as possible. But I understand, for me, it's also important. Queer experience is important to me. So when I'm looking at other queer artists, um, their experience as a, as a queer person or LGBTQIA plus person is, is impo important. So for me, if we've got exhibitions of queer art, I know that sometimes curators are queering that work. Um, but for me, a queer art show, I would also like to see really good representation um, across LGBTQIA plus identities and for that to be a bigger, a big a mix as possible. Great, thank you. Um... Brilliant. Sorry, I, I'm, sort of, I, I'm wanting to kind of keep the conversation going, but I'm aware that just trying to get people an opportunity to have their questions put. Um, I have a, a question. Sorry, there are questions coming in. So excuse my rather slow old manish management of this. Um, uh, so there's a question for Victoria um, from Anonymous. Um, Victoria, in your poem, do you situate yourself or feel your vibe um, 
uh, or, or vibe with any of the plants or animals and processes in your poem. Um, did any of them specifically speak to you as a, a queer person? Um, yeah, definitely. Can, wait, can you hear me? Like, yeah, I can, I can yeah, hear you. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, so that, uh, that story was actually um, uh, inspired by a passage um, in, um, in, uh, in, in Octavia Butler's um, archives that um, I came across while I was doing some research in her papers at the Huntington, Huntington Library in LA. Um, and it was about epiphytes and it was um, about the kind of like changing relationships that exist um, within the plant world and how um, like within um, like all around us, there are like all of these like really like vicious and um, like visceral cycles that are happening that we're just totally unaware of because of the different kind of like time realities that we live in. Um, so, I mean, I think that, uh, I think that like, you know, ecology for me, my, my focus on ecology really came through um, uh, my research in like uh, speculative and science fiction and like being immersed into um, narratives that kind of take me out of the current context or the current, um, like especially like socio-historical context that we exist within that like pre-exist us that we arrive into that like we become ourselves in. Um, so like definitely um, looking at uh, like the ways that different relationships exist um, that are like so foreign to us and everything that we're taught as human beings that they just come across as like pure fantasy um, helps me to also like um, think about my relationship with my body and my body's relationship to the world um and like also i think that um yeah like by immersing myself in myself in these other narratives it helps me to um like refigure and, and change and change these relationships um and that's like a really important part of my practice thank you um just as a reminder we, we we're now at um 2 30 but if it's okay with the panel uh, we might just carry on for maybe five or 10 minutes. Uh, I know people might have to leave. Um, there are still some more questions. Um, you can submit questions to queer ecologies talk um, at gmail.com. Um, uh, next question, which I'll, I'll, I'll maybe um, put to the whole panel um, for your responses, is from James Aldridge. Um, who says, loving the event. Um, in um, my current work, I assume Mrs. James' uh, his work, which is called Queer River, I'm interested in exploring the relationship with queering and rewilding. There is a lot of talk about rewilding and regenerative practices in relationship to landscape. What role do you feel queer arts, ecologies, practices have to play with this, um, I guess, in relation to this idea of rewilding and um, regenerative. Um, I, don't, I don't know if anyone wants to um, or respond to that. Yeah, I think um, what I was, I think what we've been talking about in terms of the natural, like the dominance of over the land here. Um, trying to control the landscape and how, I mean, sometimes we talk about it, like space, green space, and it, it is in many ways, but it has so many constraints um, as well placed on it. And I think there is a relationship between queer ecologies and, and definitely this wanting to return to something more wild with, it's just less tailored around these systems which are so confined and about these compartments. We want, I think, to see more diversity and more what would, you know, we want to see more of what would happen if nature was allowed to, to be. And I think that's got a relationship with sort of freedom and fluidity and crossing borders and boundaries. And yeah, I mean, that's where it sort of comes to play. I think also like, 
rewilding has to do like I don't know yeah wildness is like uh maybe like going against like a human instinct to categorize um like pushing against like um you know, like the human intellect is like it functions through pattern recognition and because of that we categorize things um like almost by instinct but when we categorize things we like draw lines against uh draw lines around them and that can be like a very violent process um so i think that like i don't know in 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 thinking about um like wilding is almost just like it's like pushing against um pushing against our like our, our our need to create like lots of false dichotomies um and one of one of the main ones like i think um you know obviously gender like man and woman is a false dichotomy but like human and nature is also a false dichotomy and self and other is a false dichotomy like we all exist within the same system um and like for me queerness and especially queer ecology has to do with like having an awareness of like how much um, we exist within this like um, like socialized paradigm that because we're queer, we have like the gift of, of being positioned outside of a little bit. Um, and that can then like lead us towards um, like just seeking different perspectives um, other than the ones that we've been um, like so, so violently often socialized with. Um, I also want to say as well, rewilding is kind of, um, I think, integral to just the practice of getting to grip with yourself. I guess my work itself could be rewilding, finding how um, getting back to basics, letting your body and your self become what it was meant to be before it was prescribed. Again, these binaries. Um, yeah, I think it's kind of in all of our practices and in, I think it's something as well that, um, not to be too current, but I think a lot of people outside of like art have kind of tried to um, embrace now because we are so back to bones, back to basics and restricted in a lot of things. People are um, just growing out the hair and <laughs> getting rid of like using makeup every day, things like that. So. Um, it's a big kind of cultural shift now, not just uh, the outdoors rewilding, actually people themselves. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, maybe on the back of this, um, I'll throw in some, some talking points or comments that I was thinking about. And uh, on the back of rewilding, I mean, with your reading performance, Victoria, is really thinking about this idea of entanglement. Mm you were sort of talking so much about like these sort of visceral yeah. like kind of sort of structures and um, really thinking that as a kind of sort of theoretical framework. I mean, uh, Professor Johnny Golding at the RCA has this amazing research group that uses entanglement as a kind of framework, but also really thinking across each of, of the artist's presentations, this idea of um, um, uh, another one of my favorite uh, queer theorist, um, Jose Esteban Munez, um, writes about this idea of uh, complexification, how mm. queer artists, um, you know, the complexification of, I guess, these kind of normative standards and places. And, and thinking, I was just really thinking about, you know, entanglement and complexifying, because entanglement also is about this process of complicating and compromising relationships and situations and I, I I kind of felt there was that there was that thread through a lot of your work through different strategies and um, so in Sade you know you talk about this idea of people um, you know uh, the walkers being sort of disturbed by you know um, this uh, black body in 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 the British kind of landscape um, and uh, Rosanne, I think about some of the processes of, um, you know, with the actual materiality of the landscape and the way in which you're working with it and um, really thinking about qualities of that material. So I just wanted to kind of put that idea whether, I mean, I don't know whether that has purchase for each of you, this idea of the complexity and complicating um, often um, 
yeah, uh, situations and places that, um, yeah, are, are oversimplified. Mm. Sorry, I don't, that's a, that was a ramble, but I don't know if anyone wants to. It's not really a question, it's more of a kind of... Um, I think that entanglement is it's like a liberation as well. Um, I think we'll make them work through a process that involves sort of how it's been. When, when, when you were talking about entanglement, I was thinking about being in the bottom of the premise of the work that I showed you. I was tangled in the seaweed and I had this sea life above my head, which I didn't even know what it was. And it was like this completely the, the, this underwater sort of, um, and the seascape is like, yeah, it has this connection with surrealism and, and it is a liberating experience and it sets your imagination off in, in different ways. And it, it just kind of joins your body as a material for what's around you and you're exploring things or trying to look at things in a new way. Like I said, that we're all so used to living by in terms of, um, Yes, it's, it's good to think about that, that term entanglement. In some of my words, I'm literally, I, I am sort of tangled up in the, in the material of the, of the natural landscape. Um, as you were talking, Harold, I was thinking about um, uh, uh, a verse from um, from Earth Seed from Octavia Butler's Parable series. Um, all that you touch, you change. All that um, all that you change changes you. Um, and I think this year, I mean, like there's um, uh, uh, Lucia Pietruisti said in um, the um, Serpentine podcast, Back to Earth, which I host with her. Um, that there's like nothing like a pandemic to really demonstrate like how connected we all are. And, um, you know, I think that's, um, that's, that's really true. And something I've been thinking about as well, like an another one of these like um, false dichotomies is maybe like the object, objects and relationships between them. Um, like we often, we always think about like things first and relationships between them. Um, when really it's like maybe the relationships exist just as much as the objects are, are even more important than the objects themselves. Um, because we all, um, you know, we all become with, through, and in relation to like everything around us. Um, you know, it's again, kind of like this, this trying to like go against and push against um, this like instinct and need to like name things and draw a line around them and categorize them. Um, you know, and we should really like sit with like how complex everything is and how much like you really, that's like a total illusion that, um, that, that is like, that is created. Like, I think it's really important to remember that, um, you know, humans are the only animals that completely create the environment in which the brain shapes, um, is shaped and grows. Um, so like we, um, you know, we need to also try to, yeah, like, push against um push push against these like really convoluted categories that have like evolved and are reified like even in just the way that we speak and are we we're, we're taught to speak absolutely um, um we do have still some more questions um and uh let me uh there was one Sorry, I've lost, I've lost my place. Hold on. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, okay. Well, th this this is maybe an interesting question. Um, so, um, Julian Connock um, puts to the whole panel: How might we begin to break down binaries of communication and thinking from a queer ecological perspective? Um, this is quite a general kind of question. Don't know. Um, you, might want to address that in relation to something specific, but um, how might we break down binaries of communication and thinking from a queer ecological perspective? I don't know if anyone wants to take that on. I think empathy is really important when thinking about this. Um, yeah, I mean, I've been thinking a lot about the binary of like thinking and feeling and how, um, you know, within the English language, especially like that's like a really, um, 
that's really embodied this this binary of like you know if you're rational then you don't have any emotion um in like what you're thinking or saying um I don't know I, I, I did a performance in four iterations last year where like uh, I was kind of telling the story um, or it involved like the story of my um, family history and like immigration and displacement and like how 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 that's like shaped us and me into the person that I am but then also like how um, how then you know uh, there is the opportunity to shape yourself through like your own experiences and um, uh, in telling the story, like often names and sentences are replaced with musical notes or musical sentences um, in order to kind of like demonstrate the shortcomings of language and the, the, the inability um, often in order to like to express anything that's really queer or mm -hmm. post-colonial or, or anything within um, this tool that we're given, which is shaped and created by histories of, of colonialism, capitalism mm -hmm. and patriarchy. Um, I don't know, that's not really an answer, but like, uh, <laughs> I think, um, I don't know, I think this this year is like really like, um, it's been so much about like empathy and and and, uh, and like patience. Um, yes. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, maybe I can sort of segue that point actually, because that was another thread I think, um, Jade and Roseanne, I think you, you, you did both address maybe the, the specificity of this year and working in the conditions of this year. I don't know if you also want to speak to that. I mean, Victoria's talking about empathy. Um, I don't know if the, the experience of kind of working and making work has um, engendered any particular experiences for you um, that you might want to speak to. Um. For me, it was it is it's about reconnection, and I can identify with what Shardy was talking about. You know that that break of having access to the landscape or the place that you work, and I uh, I didn't work outside. I didn't sort of work in the way that I had been working. It was a real step back in is my work is it is a connection. It is part of how I connect um, in general, or it became part of how I connect with my practice sort of change. And it wasn't a space that I felt freely able to access. I didn't go into places I was working in, in Hebden Bridge and Tomlin and think, I've got access to this landscape. You know, I'm totally entitled and, and privileged to take up space. It was very tentative for accessing this space and feeling um, able to work in that way was a was a process and in freeing yourself of lots of constraints that have been put on you. Um, yeah. And get to work to sort of maybe lose that freedom. Um, I, I did lose a lot of that sort of feeling of freedom during lockdown, like a lot of people have done. Um, so when I went back out there and made the work, the sort of lockdown lifted, it was it was difficult, but it was also, I think that energy was probably in the, in the making of the work as well. I think I had to adjust to not having, again, not having that access, but also not feeling like I had anything to say. <laughs> um, I think that's been a massive part of my year, um, which has been nice actually, just to kind of show up for a bit and <laughs> um, I have the desire to make work sometimes but with no kind of clear goal or context um, and that's resulted in me either not making work or just making things that are kind of inconsequential to my practice just drawing things from my living room walls and stuff and not making things part of this bigger scope of uh, commentary about gender and stuff um, but I do miss that kind of push to want to say something. I think, again, because my practice is so inspired by my everyday life and my experiences and like growing and figuring out who I am and how I interact with people and all that stuff, because there's been so much <laughs> less of that. <laughs> there's been so much less to, to say and to make. Um, but again, it's just about adapting to the different situations and um, 
yeah and and that quiet and that peace and that time away from is also useful sometimes you just have to kind of try and figure out how sometimes it doesn't feel so so useful it feels um it's hard to not to not make it you, you feel guilty i think um particularly when you're used to just getting up and going and doing whatever but um it's been nice to kind of let myself off for a bit yeah. brilliant Thank you. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Jade. Thank. We're going to have to wrap up now. Unfortunately, I mean, there's always so much more to say. Um, but I have to say, a huge thanks um, to all of you again for your um, incredible presentations and um, you know taking time to put those together with thought and care and um, and responding to, to the questions. And um, thanks also to our audience um, for submitting your questions and for um, staying with us throughout the session. I'm just gonna do some final quick thanks just to kind of wrap up. Um, I particularly want to thank uh, Leeds Art Gallery, uh, Holly Grange, who's been amazing, the curator at Leeds Art Gallery, has put this together. and. Uh, Sarah Brown, the principal keeper, and the whole Leeds Art Gallery team. My colleague Marion Harrison, um, who's amazing, and the fine art uh, team at um, Leeds back at uni. Um, uh, as well as the technical support we've had from Stuart and Joe at Lumen and uh, Will Simpson. Um, a quick note, um, we do have another talk uh, on Thursday, December the 3rd um, at 1pm with Lena Le Lapalite, which I'm, I'm saying that correctly, and uh, Lena Lapalite La, La um, was part of the collaborative uh, trio of artists who won the Golden Lion at the Venice Biennale, the last Venice Biennale, um, for their durational performance work and opera Sea, Sun and Sea Marina, um, which was staged in the Lithuanian Pavilion. So it's really amazing to have Lena um, with us. Um, and you can uh, book on for that on, onto the Eventbrite uh, or go to Leeds Art Gallery. Um, okay, thank you so much. I'm going to wrap up. Um, it's been brilliant and have a good day, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>